I'd like to share a few thoughts on the disappearance of Summer Wells, a case that has brought much interest uh, as the five-year-old has been missing more than two weeks. The first thing we notice about the case is that the father's account is not reliable in the sense that he's repeating what someone else told him. So that must be discounted. And I'm aware of his criminal background. I'm aware of the um, the obvious issues of substance abuse that may surround the family. Um, but I'd like to focus on the mother's statement, and I've broken it down here. It's a little bit shorter. You can get the full statement online. But to show what is concerning what we know and what we don't know. So I'm going to start with the conclusion of the matter. The conclusion of the matter is that we don't know the source of the mother's guilt in this statement. And I'd like to show that to everyone here. The mother has indicated a belief or knowledge that Summer isn't coming back. Now that goes against the normal parental capacity of protection and denial, especially a mother. So it's something that I, I'm concerned about. But when she was finally uh, convinced to go into the media and speak to the media, which itself is unusual in terms of behavioral analysis. The mother wants to call out to the kidnapper. The mother said, and I, I've abbreviated a bit, me and my mother and her were planting flowers and we went in after we got done washing our hands and she got a piece of candy from grandma. I walked her all the way over to the porch and watched her walking into the kitchen. So, from that statement, and, and it's abbreviated, it says more, I'm able to conclude neglect. Now, some will counter and say, given the family circumstances, domestic violence, substance abuse, perhaps some cognitive limitations, that's to be expected. And it's true, that is to be expected. <clears throat> but it's in the language regarding what happened. So if a sex offender has grabbed Little Summer, or human trafficking and that sort of thing, a kidnapper. Mom shows guilt, but I can't tell whether the guilt is because she caused Summer's disappearance or the guilt of neglect, which is here. But there's some also interesting things within this statement that call our attention to specific details. Me, so she's asked what happened. Me and my mother and her. We like to hear a mother in particular use her daughter's name. And this was the beginning of what happened. Um, she uses the pronoun her. I believe at this point even, that's some distancing language, psychological distancing. I say, well, what about if mom has cognitive limitations? Um, that will impact the language. It certainly does. But if she speaks with an expectation of being understood and communicates with people, we adjust our context and we still analyze the words. Me and my mother and her, and we note the order, were planting flowers and we went in after we got done washing our hands. Now, if you're planting flowers in the dirt, your hands are dirty and the expectation is you're going to wash your hands. The expectation is not that you're going to have a need to talk about it. And this is where we often explore for guilt. I don't doubt that she washed her hands, and I'm not saying she lied about that. But what she's doing is including information that isn't necessary for the case, but does something else. We often find washing when it is included unnecessarily as another signal of guilt, among other things. So washing our hands not only will cause us to question, hey, why do you need to include that? We're not reinterpreting washing of hands to mean something else. We're wondering why the need to include that. We often find it in statements of guilt. And she, so another pronoun she, got a piece of candy from grandma. Washing our hands slows down the pace of the statement. Tell us what happened. She went missing while we were planting flowers. That would be very quick and easy. But instead, we have a pace that's being slowed down, which often indicates 
tension, stress, and possibly even deception later on. Now, I don't know if that's the case here, but I'm certainly open to it. Then I had the pronoun she again, not Summer, got a piece of candy from Grandma. That's immaterial to what happened, we would think. But this also slows down the pace of getting to what is essentially the information that's needed. Now, she's a five-year-old, and this is a normal household. This is all things that we presuppose. And five-year-olds love to play. They love to wander. They love to have candy. I walked her to the porch. I walked her all the way to the porch. As if it's an extraordinary event, something out of the ordinary, something that's not normal. This is a portrayal of the subject by herself, the mother, as a good and conscientious, mo conscientious mother who is diligently watching over her child. The need to include this information suggests to the contrary. And when you, when you have a couple of those points, you realize you're looking at neglect. So it's not just the, the socioeconomic status, the uh, substance abuse issues, the domestic violence reports, um, some of those things. It's in the language as well and watched her walking into the kitchen. On a normal day, outside in your yard, planting flowers or doing anything, would you recall watching someone all the way in at age five who runs in and out likely on her own many times? This is another indicator of guilt, of guilt due to neglect. So it is possible that a sex offender got summer, and mom has tremendous guilt for not watching her more carefully. That's certainly a possibility. And another possibility is that mom's actions caused something to go terribly wrong with Summer. The first one we look at, uh, you know, this, we talk about guilty knowledge a lot. Guilty knowledge being uh, mom knows what happened to her. And the guilt is because of that. But the first one we're looking at is called attendant guilt. In other words, something took place that the subject didn't do. She didn't cause Summer's disappearance, but something else was going on there, and she feels guilty over that. And I don't know at this point, because of the, um, the way the interview was conducted, what it is. Now, the interviewer had an opportunity to say, hey, you didn't want to speak out because of all the nasty comments that people make on social media. What would you like to say to them? This would have given her an opportunity to say, I didn't cause Summer's disappearance. I don't know why the interviewer didn't ask the obvious question. But if your child was missing, would you care what people on social media said? Now, you might if it was impacting search efforts, which it wasn't. The search efforts were tremendous. But a maternal instinct, and for most people, just human empathy, and not knowing what happened would cause them to do whatever it takes to run out, call for her child immediately, and address the kidnapper. So investigators have a difficult case on their hands, not simply because of the time that has passed along, but because of the mother's statement. You, you've heard things from media where it appears law enforcement is confused, quote unquote, about what happened. And that's a, a, a deliberate statement that's meant to say, we've got some issues here. We don't have a clear answer of what happened. And that's important. I had a case many years ago where a little girl went missing and the father was deceptive about what happened. What happened? when she went missing. And it proved later on that he didn't do it. What was he deceptive about then? We learned that he was deceptive because he was under the influence of drugs and at that point uh, incapable of giving eyes on protection to the little girl who was able to open the door herself and wander away. So that's called attendant guilt and it's very difficult at times to discern. So the conclusion of the matter is here is it's inconclusive. We need more uh, 
more of a statement. The 911 call, of course, would be uh, telling. I don't have any association with the case. I'm just going strictly by the public record. Mom shows guilt, but mom also shows the knowledge, referencing her daughter in the past tense several times, that her daughter isn't coming back alive. We need to know why that is. Has she been told something that was so sobering that it knocked parental capacities down, or the capacities of protection and denial? Or is it something else that needs to be said? 